Well, it, it's a joy. There, there's nothing better for me than Sunday mornings reflecting back on who Jesus is and what he's up to. We're, we're in the book of Luke this morning, Luke chapter 10. So I want to invite you, if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Luke chapter 10. And we're going to look at, I think, an incredible text. Here's what the text says in Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Follow along with me. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and she said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me out. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken from her. Church, we're in Luke chapter 10, and we're following this story where Luke has been telling Theophilus, this is what it looks like to follow Jesus. Theo's been, been getting this letter from Luke that says, I want you to increase in your certainty about who Jesus is. And it was in Luke chapter 9 that Jesus called his disciples, and he sent them out to go live on mission, to go be the living proof of a loving God. And now Luke has been slowly sharing stories with each of us as he's been writing this narrative and telling us what does it look like to follow Jesus. Now, last week was the Great Miss Part 1. Remember Great Miss Part 1? I pulled out my, my golf club, and we talked about swinging hard and actually missing the point. And, and Jesus, through the author of Luke, used the Good Samaritan as one of the key ways that I think often we miss the point. We miss it this way. It's a head knowledge or it's a heart knowledge. Dallas Willard says it this way. It's the longest 12 or 18-inch journey of your life, depending on how long your neck is to get from here to here. The lawyer last week had all the right answers, but he missed it. And part of what we see is he comes to Jesus and the lawyer says this, what must I do to have eternal life? Is that a good question, church? Yeah, it's like the most important question you could ever ask. So by good, I mean imperative. I mean the only question that matters. What must I do to get in? And the lawyer, who's this expert of the law, asked Jesus, and Jesus says this, it's, the question's easy. You already know the answer. All you have to do is love God and others perfectly. That's it. The, the, it's not rocket science. He's not hiding the answer to what must I do to get in. He says, love God perfectly, love others perfectly, have perfect compassion. And he tells the story of the Good Samaritan of what that looks like. Meet every need and give generously to the tens. And at the end of that response from Jesus, I think his hope for the lawyer was the lawyer would say, oh, crud. Right? That the lawyer would say, Jesus, I've got a problem. But what does the lawyer do at the end of last week's passage? Anybody remember? What's the lawyer do? Okay, now I know what I'm supposed to do. I'm going to go work hard, and I'm going to love better, and I'm going to just do better. Now, how do you think the lawyer did after he left that interaction with Jesus? Did he nail it? No, not at all. And I feel like sometimes in the church, we promote this just love harder. Just try better. Church, you just got to put in more effort. I don't actually think that's the gospel. That's what I grew up with. That was kind of my understanding was I just got to give it more effort. I just got to try harder. Then I'll do better. But here's the reality. That's called behavior modification. You ever try that with your kids? Don't do that. Why? Because I said so. And that actually behavior modification can work for a season. It can work for a little bit, but I promise you it's not eternal and it won't continue and it doesn't give the fruit. See, here's the issue as we're following Luke's narrative and we're following the story of Jesus. Luke wants us to say, are we actually following Jesus? None of us can live and to love this way on our own efforts, by our own acclaim. And this is why I think the point of the gospel, which is beautiful, is that every single one of us needs a heart transplant. We need to change from the inside out. We can't just keep trying harder because we all know our limits. We all know our selfishness. We all know our sin. And until we change from the inside, we'll actually just continue to try to do this on our own and we'll continually fail. That was the point of the Good Samaritan, was that we can't love like that. So we should radically run to Jesus and say, Jesus, help me. And Jesus is standing here saying, I am the solution. And it was so sad last week that the Good Samaritan story didn't lead the lawyer to get it. In fact, the lawyer just kept missing it, I think. He just kept living in his own strength, for his own power, for his own glory, and it wasn't actually accomplishing the heart change that he desired, that Jesus desired. But Jesus says there's an opportunity here. 
Here's the reality is what he tells the lawyer. Talk is cheap. Preaching is easy. You must actually live this gospel. You must live out your faith. And here's what I love. If we want to live out the life and the love of Jesus, who should we be spending the most time with? Jesus. If we actually want to love the things that Jesus loves and care about the things that he cares about and live the way that he lives, what should we be doing, church? Following Jesus. Sitting at his feet. But, but here's the reality. We've talked about this upside-down kingdom of God that Jesus initiates, and on many levels it's hard for us to understand because can I just be really direct and honest? I love America. Huge fan of America. I think it's the best country that we can live in. The freedom that we've been given is incredible, but on many levels the gospel is anti-American. Because in America we work harder, we try harder, and in the gospel we say we can't do it. So what Luke wants us to see is that he doesn't want us to miss where we all must grow in our journeys with Jesus. In Jesus' upside-down kingdom of God, he's getting ready to send his disciples out to go. Is that an action word or a passive word, to go? It's an action word. He wants us to go love. Is that an action word or a passive word? It's an action word. He wants us to go follow. Action word or passive word? Action. But for us to go, to love, and to follow, here's what I love about Jesus. Jesus. Upside down kingdom, what must we do? The story he gives us here is we must sit and we must listen. Now, is it bad to make sure that everyone at church has coffee or butt cushions? There's extra ones in the front, by the way. Is that a bad thing? Or that you fill out your Connect card this morning? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? That's a good thing. I'm so thrilled that we have a guest services team. I'm so thrilled that Jen was able to serve you. But for many of you in this illustration this morning, you came here not to get your butt cushion or to get your Connect card. You could have done that before church and you could have done that after church. What do you want to do right now? You want to listen to Jesus. And in this weird illustration, I'm Jesus. And I get there's breakdowns to the metaphor. I totally get it. But you're like, uh, Jen, like your husband's talking and I know that you don't necessarily want to listen, but we do, right? <laughs> but here's my conviction. It's not bad things for many of us in the church that's keeping us from God. It's good things. It's those things that we reflected on this morning. They're not bad, potentially. Now, I don't know what you're really spending your time, treasure, talent on. Maybe they are bad. I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt of your, as your pastor that they're not. But Luke doesn't want us to miss that if we're going to go take hell with our water pistols, if we're going to go storm the gates of hell with our water pistols, it's got to start not with action, or it is action, it's just a different kind of action. It's sitting at the feet of Jesus. It's understanding his heart. So that as we go, we're not just spinning our wheels, we're not just putting effort in places that he wouldn't actually put it. And instead, we're listening to him. So this morning's text is actually part two. The great miss part one was the, the lawyer that had all the head knowledge. But in part two, I feel like there's another great miss that we're going to see in the text. We've already read it this morning. But right now, I'm going to pray over the text, and we're going to walk through it. So Father God, as we open this word, as we walk through these verses, many of us missed it because Jen was distracting or our hearts are distracted. Right now, don't let us miss it. You've written this word for Theophilus, but I believe you've written it for us. Help us to see your word as it comes alive to us and penetrate our hearts so that we might not miss it, we pray. For your glory, for our good, and for the joy of people that have yet to experience peace. We ask these things, and everybody said, amen. So here's the text this morning. There's a context to the story. Short story, you may have missed it. I read it earlier. We're going to walk through it right now. It's the story of Mary and Martha. You ever heard this story? I gotta be honest, if last week was Jesus' like best teaching, the Good Samaritan, this week is the best teaching that Drew has never learned to live. That's this week's text. This is an incredibly difficult text. In fact, when I was making the outline for Luke, I intentionally circled this week as a week that I should be on vacation. <laughs> but here's the good news, church. It's easy to preach. It's just hard to live. <laughs> Here's the context of the story, which I think applies to all of us. There's a geographical context. Now, remember where we are in Luke. Luke is in the middle of a six-month journey where Jesus is going down to Jerusalem, and he's preparing to do what? To go to the cross. He's going to go die. There's this six-month journey. Now, geographically, in the context of this story, Luke is not writing a narrative that, that's chronological. Part of how we know that is this story right here. Here's what he says. Now as they went on their way, now we're early into the six-month journey. We just started it a couple of, of sentences ago. But right now, he's all the way down just a couple miles outside of Jerusalem. That's the geography 
here. But Luke doesn't care about the timeline. He cares about the themes. So he's writing in a thematic way. Last week was the, the lawyer misses it. This week was the saint misses it. I think it's easy for us as saints to say things like, well, it's a good thing I'm not one of them, right? It's a good thing I'm not a Pharisee. It's a good thing I'm not a lawyer. And here's what Luke does. Whoa, 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 be careful. Because the lawyer misses it, but so too does the saint. So the geographical context is he's, they're just a couple miles outside of Jerusalem. This is actually just a short period of time before he's going to be crucified. But that's not Luke's primary point. His point is on the journey, the theme here. And here's the theme. There's this woman that Jesus knows. Now, Martha is her name, and Martha and Jesus are close. Martha, we know a lot about from the other Gospels. We know that Martha had a sister named Mary, and she also had a brother named Lazarus. That's worth bonus points. Your points don't mean anything, but I'll give them to you. So you've got Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. They're three of the most well-known siblings in the Bible. We know lots about Lazarus. We know that he died and that Jesus resurrected him. We know that Mary and Martha had a very intimate relationship with Jesus. They were tight. They were close. They knew each other well. So here's the cultural context. There's this woman named Martha. Now, so far in their culture, let me be very, very clear. We've looked at the culture of this early Judeo pre-Christian culture, so we know it well. And I want to be very careful of the things I'm going to say right now. So men and women pay attention. In their culture, women had a primary role. Their role was underlined. What was their role to do in the home? Their role was to welcome. They would often give out awards, not literal awards, but they would have the Mother of the Year Award. They would have the Hostess with the Mostess Award. The woman's role was actually to be the best host possible. Now, that was a cultural distinction. I don't think that's true today. Men, be very careful in the kitchen during Thanksgiving not to misquote this text. But here was Martha's role. Her role is this, Jesus showed up, and I think she knew that Jesus was coming. And if Jesus comes over for dinner, does he come just by himself? Who's been following Jesus? Like everybody, right? Because they're trying to figure out who this Jesus is. It's the same reason why Luke writes the letter to say, hey, this is who Jesus is. So when Jesus comes over for dinner, it's not one or two guests that come with him. I think there's a whole entourage. So Jesus comes over, and Martha welcomes him into her house. Now, we don't know if she had a husband. We don't know the complete context. Here's what we know. We just know it's her house. She's the leader of the home on some level. She has a responsibility. So when Jesus shows up, she is running around, and she is making sure that everything is ready. It's kind of like this week for Thanksgiving, right? How many of you guys are hosting Thanksgiving? Anybody? I'm so sorry, right? I'm going to my in-laws. I'm looking forward to it. I'm doing nothing, right? Martha, on the other hand, was like you. She's running around. She's getting ready. Jesus and the crowds are showing up, at least the most intimate disciples, and they're going to show up. So when Jesus gets there, this woman named Martha welcomes him into her home. She's killing it. She's doing a phenomenal job. She's prepared for this moment. She's executed. The turkey comes out of the oven at the right time. Everything is looking good culturally. Here's the problem. She's got this sister. Is that a problem for anybody else or just, just some of us? <laughs> So again, here's what I love about holidays, right? We start to see the sibling sin that comes out. And I love siblings. I love seeing my three kids interact. I love my sister. I love my sister-in-law. But isn't there something about holidays that part of the stress is like, who's going to do what now, right? So Mary is on the scene. And let's look at Mary. Martha has this sister called Mary who happens to be probably a little younger. And here's what Mary's doing. Mary is actually doing action. You see the action of Martha, right? Martha's running around, she's getting ready, she's welcoming, she's greeting, she's cooking, she's doing all these sorts of things. Then there's Mary. Mary, when Jesus comes over, she's taking action too. Mary is sitting at the Lord's feet and listening to his teaching. Now, here's really strange. Culturally speaking, what is Mary doing? It's strange for two reasons. Where's the woman supposed to be, culturally speaking, as they throw a party? I'd like a woman to answer, just so that we're okay. In the, that is a good woman right there. <laughs> Culturally speaking, Mary and Martha are supposed to be in the kitchen. It might have been outside of the kitchen because the kitchen might have been outside, but that's what they're supposed to be doing, serving the other people, serving the disciples. Now, the disciples, culturally speaking, were typically men, and what were the men doing at this time? Similar to what they're going to be doing on Thursday. What were the men doing? <laughs> Sitting down, listening to the game. That's what they're doing, watching football, right? So here's why this is so weird. A, Mary's not in the kitchen. B, so that's weird culturally, but B, not only is she not doing what she was culturally expected to do, but here's what she is doing. She's doing what the men are supposed to be doing. 
Sitting down, listening to Jesus teach. That was a disciple's role, to sit, to listen. In their culture, which is somewhat similar to our culture, not, not similar to our culture, the front row was the best place to be. Now, bless the, the eight of you that have decided that. I don't know, and Ken, thank you. But for the most part, at least at Vintage Grace, the front row is where there's always seats available, right? But where is Mary right now? She's sitting at the feet of Jesus. I think she's in the front row. I think she's getting whatever wisdom scraps that she can get. She's eating it up. She's not preparing a meal. She's inhaling one. That's what she's doing, metaphorically speaking. So you've got this weird cultural rift that's going on. I don't know about you guys, but if you're running around serving, maybe you have a wedding or you have a party, you have Thanksgiving, and if you're running around serving and you see other people that are supposed to be helping you, they were signed up on Friday night for the setup team. They were supposed to be here. And they're sitting outside playing fantasy football. Now, usually, as a good Christian, which is an oxymoron, we'll deal with that later, as a good Christian, you can, you can give grace for a minute, maybe two, maybe even 20 if you're a female and you're a saint. But at some point, what starts to happen when you're working your tail off and no one else is, what starts to happen? Your flesh comes out, right? Right? You're a little frustrated, you're a little tired, you're going, what the heck's going on? And that's, I think, the context that leads to the complaint. And here's Martha's primary complaint, if I can use my words. Jesus, you missed me. You missed me. D don't all of us just want to be seen? We just want to be acknowledged? I'm amazed at how enduring humanity can be as long as they know they're not enduring on their own. If they just hear that, man, we're not isolated, we're not by ourselves, here's the complaint that Martha has. Jesus, you miss me. Here's what she says. Lord, you do not care that my sister has left me serve alone. You missed me, Jesus. Now, I want to see the context that Luke gives us. He doesn't just jump straight to the complaint. Here's what Luke says. But Martha was, what, church? Distracted by evil, bad, sinful things. Now, what was Martha distracted by? By much? Serving. Is service a good thing? It's on the back of your connect card, so I hope it's not a bad thing, right? How can I serve? How can I be involved? We believe that we serve out of our joy. We believe that those are opportunities for joy. They're not obstacles. They're not things that we should on, that you should do this. No, no, no. We at Vintage Grace believe that we should serve for our joy, for what makes us happy. Is Martha's joy compromised right now? I think so. I think her joy is drastically compromised, but understand, she's doing what should, in theory, be bringing her joy. She's doing good things. She's running around. She's serving Jesus. I mean, how many of you guys are having him over for dinner Thursday night? Like, would that be fun? I'd be a little stressful, personally. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure he'd be good with Jack in the Box. Maybe it would take all the pressure off. She's distracted by good things, which is why I say I don't think the greatest enemy that many of us face is cancer and addiction and those kind of things. Those are real enemies in a fallen, messed up world. I think the greatest enemy that many of us face is good things that distract us from the best things. So here's Martha running around doing good things, distracted with much serving. And then, now I love this. It is a good thing that Jesus is patient. Here's what happens. She goes up to him. Now, I think that Martha's a saint. So let me be very clear. As I was studying the text, it just reminded me of all of you saints that share your hearts with me, that, that are, are willing. Maybe it's in your life group. Maybe it's with your pastor during a moment of confession. But here's the reality. I do believe that you're all saints. We say at Vintage Grace, we are sinners saved by grace. The other thing I like saying is that we are saints who really sin. I believe if we love Jesus, if he, is our if he is our brother, if God is our father, that we are saints, that we are redeemed, that we are reclaimed. But does anyone here still struggle with sin as a saint? Whew, I was afraid two of you were to raise your hand. I was going to be like, I am in the wrong church. It's a real thing. We struggle with sin. It's a battle that we're in the middle of. And I'm not saying that sin doesn't matter. God hates sin. We hate sin. But we still do it. And part of it's the battle and the fight that we're in the middle of. And here's what I love. She goes up to him, but because she's a saint, I don't think she like is slamming pots. You know when you're agitated in the kitchen and you really want someone to know? And you're like, ha, ha, ha. if only someone would help me. I think I heard that from Jen earlier, right? I don't think that she's doing that. I think she's too holy for that. We're not, but I think she is. I think she's too holy. I think what she does is she's agitated She's irritated, but 
But I think out of her love and respect for her Lord, I think she kind of goes up to the front and she kind of just scoots up next to him and she kind of sits there. And I do think she wants to make sure that he, she gets her. <clears throat> but I don't think she's trying to make a big scene. I don't think she's trying to scream. Now, now, there's nothing that Luke tells us one way or the other. I've always thought this was this she throws a fit. I think she's a saint. I don't think she wants to embarrass Jesus. So she goes up to him and she says, Lord, she says, you're, you're my Lord. Now, you're really, really busy, Lord, being God. So I get that, that you're a little distracted with being God right now and teaching these poor people. But do you not care that my sister has left me alone to serve? Now, the way in which Luke writes the story is simply this. There's an expected response from Jesus, which is, oh, my gosh, I'm so sorry I missed you. I think that's what Martha is actually saying to God. And maybe you've said that prayer before, right? Remember, one third of the Psalms is filled with laments where we go to God and we're like, God, hello, do you know what's going on in America? And God's like, oh my gosh, I, I missed it. It totally slipped my mind. And I feel like that's part of what Martha does here. Martha says, Jesus, do you not care that my sister has left me alone to serve? I don't actually hear the anger as much as I hear the miss. Because she's expecting Jesus right now to say, ha, ah, I totally care. You're right. And this is what I love. She tells God what to do. Now, none of us would ever do that, right? <laughs> ever. In our prayer life, we would never tell God what to do. Here's what she does. Tell her. This is where I think she gets a little more stern. Tell her what to do. She's actually giving, the way Luke writes it, she's actually giving God a command. I don't know how that works for you, but it's not very good practice for me. She's agitated, she's irritated, she goes to Jesus. She says, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me alone to serve? Tell her then to help me out. Here's what she's saying. Jesus, you missed me. Do you see me? And church, I don't want to be so naive to think that we haven't said that same thing. Jesus, you missed me this week. You didn't see what happened at work. You didn't see what happened at home. You didn't see what happened in my marriage. You missed me. She's crying out for help. And here's the core issue in her complaint that you missed me. The core issue is simply this. She's forgotten who Jesus is. Now, this is a gal that totally gets who Jesus is. She's been invited by Jesus over for dinner. She's hung out with him. They've gone to restaurants together. They've spent time and treasure and talent. They've done ministry together. And those closest to Jesus sometimes are one that miss him most. And this is really the first time we see a female miss him. Because for the most part, Luke has made a point in his letter to say, who exclusively gets the gospel? The women. Almost exclusively. And the Pharisees and the religious men don't. But here's the core issue. Who is Jesus? So Jesus says, and I like that Luke highlights it for us, but the Lord, he is Lord. But the Lord answered Martha, Martha. And I love the double word usage here. Martha. Martha. I know your name. And I know that you're really distracted. I see you. I see you more than you see you. Because is that not the point of Christianity is that what we've done when we become Christians is we take our life and we realize that we can't take care of it on our own and it would be better if we gave our life to Jesus so he would take care of it than we would on our own. That's what it means to be a Christian. It's to remove yourself from the throne of your life and actually give it to the guy that deserves it that will do way better with you with it than you will. He says, Martha, Martha, I see that you are anxious and troubled about many things. If you just do a, a surface word study of that word anxious and troubled, it's, it's in direct contrast to the word peace. Remember, we've been talking about people of peace. Politically speaking, that's one of the applications for me in America right now is, are we people of peace? Do we have a peace? Because as we look at the rope, which is this illustration we've been using for a long time, this rope that goes on forever, and this black part of the rope that represents our life, here's the reality. God somewhere in here offers us eternal peace because history forever is assured in him. Your future is assured in him. But how many of us have moments during our life at some point in the black part of the rope where we experience anxiety and trouble about many things? Anyone? Stress, 
Here's what the Bible says. You know most of these verses. Again, easy to know them, harder to live. Proverbs 3 says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and all your ways. Submit to him. Give it to him and he will make your path straight. Philippians, Paul writes this, chapter 4, verse 6, Do not be anxious about what? Anything. Okay, well, good. That means I can hold on to this piece of my life. But in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Going on in Luke in a couple of chapters, which means next year sometime, he says this. Consider the ravens, 1224. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. How much more valuable are you than birds? You're his son. You're his daughter. What are you anxious about? Matthew 11, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden and burdened, and I will give you rest, peace. Going on, John 14 says this, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give it to you as the world gives, because the world gives with an if-then caveat. If you do this, then you'll get this. No, 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 do not let your hearts be troubled, then do not be afraid. I give rest, peace. Colossians 3.15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since and then be for members of one body, you were called as a body to peace, so be thankful. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times, in every way. Psalm 55, cast your cares on him and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. In Proverbs, anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. And most recently, we were in 1 Peter 5, where Peter writes this, cast all your what? Anxiety, troubles on him because he what? Cares for you. See, her complaint and her critique of Jesus is, do you see me? And if she really knew who Jesus is and she understood what he's done and she reflected on her week before, what would she see? How he cares for her. How he loves her. How there's nothing going on in her life that he's not aware of. Now, you might not like what God's doing in your life. That's a separate issue. But whatever is in the middle of your life right now, this is one of the hardest truths to wrap your mind around. Whatever's going on in your life right now, that's a gift from God for your good. Chew on that when you live in a hospital for four years. Changes everything. There is nothing right now in your life that's outside of God's provision and plan for you. He uses that which Satan intends for evil for good. It's her critique of Jesus is she doesn't know who Jesus is. So he says, Martha, Martha, you're anxious. You're troubled about many things. And more often than not, what are the things on our list that we thought about this morning? They're good things. Family, friends, food, ministry, good things. But here's what Jesus says, but only one thing is necessary. One thing. Not good things, one thing. So when you look at this rope, what is it that we're spending our time, treasure, talent on? Is it on what's necessary or is it on good things? Have we understood as Luke is helping us understand, what does it mean to follow Jesus? It means to be focused on him as the one thing who is necessary. And then you want to really tick somebody off, say, not only did you miss it, but your sister got it. Talk about sibling rivalry. And again, Jesus is not trying to tick her off. Jesus is trying to help her understand, here's a picture of that one thing. So Mary, Mary has chosen the good portion. Mary is not going to be consumed with the black part of the robe because she understands that that will all perish, that that will all fade. She's living in view of eternity. It's what Peter wrote in 1 Peter, always live in view of eternity. Everything. And that doesn't mean that we sit around passively and that we don't actually invest well today. It just means that everything we say and everything we do should be with a heart and a focus on tomorrow. Everything. On eternity. On what matters most. And this is what I love Because there's a time to work. There's a time to be busy. You remember Luke chapter 5? Jesus is talking to the disciples, and they're trying to figure out. So the, the, the disciples of John, they fast. Should we fast? And Jesus says this. Look, when the bridegroom is with you, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to party. You're supposed to party because I'm here. There's going to come a time, Jesus says, when I'm going to leave this place. And that time's going to be 2016 in El Dorado Hills. And there's going to be a time that I'm not here. And in that moment, in EDH in 2016, Jesus says this, greater work is going to be done in you than is work that I did. Now, wrap your head around that. We'll get there in a couple of months. 
But here's his point. There's a time to work. There's a time to be busy. Life is short and hell is hot. Those are real statements. But right now, Jesus tells Martha, but Martha, the bridegroom's in your kitchen. Jesus is right here. I'm right in front of you. What are you doing? Mary, though, on the other hand, she's chosen the good portion, and that will not be taken from her. Now, we got Black Friday coming up, lots of shopping. Any of you guys going to Worst Buy? Anyone? No one's going to Worst Buy? Now, is that a store? No. What's the store called? Best Buy. Would Worst Buy work in America? No. That's dumb. We want the Best Buy, and here's all Jesus says. I'm the best. Trusting me, treasuring me, sitting at my feet, I've got the best plan for your life. And you're never going to know what it is unless you stop doing and start sitting at my feet. So he tells her, he says, stop. You want me to tell Mary to stop? But Mary's doing what's best. Mary's sitting with me, and the only way Mary's going to know how to go live for me and be like me as a living proof of loving God is if she sets apart any moment that she has to actually listen to me. There's tons of implications in this text, tons. Short text, massive application, right? Here's the first one that I don't want us to miss. Theology matters. You see that? Do you see that in the text? If we don't know who Jesus is, we're going to miss a whole lot. Thinking rightly, like A.W. Tozer says, the most important thing about you is what you think about when you think about God. It changes everything. We must think rightly because when we think rightly, we recognize Jesus and we actually know what it means to live for him. Here's one of the beautiful truths I see in this text that applies to you and me today. Jesus has no needs. Again, I look at my early life of ministry, and that's why I'm like, I don't know why I'm teaching this, because I was the young pastor that would run around like a chicken with my head cut off, and I'd have my saints and my friends say, hey, can I bother you? <laughs> yeah, sure, I'm actually here for you. But apparently I'm so busy, because I'm serving Jesus, and I'll never forget, I'm reading my Bible years ago, and, and it just hit me like a two by four. Not so much here or here, but right about here. And here's what Jesus said, I died for the church, you actually don't have to. She's mine. I got her. It changed ministry. I started to recognize that Jesus doesn't need me. Now, again, does that give anyone a sense of relief right now? Because you're going to family dinners this week, and you're like, I got to save somebody. You can't. You have no ability to save anyone. feel a little better? Recognize that Jesus is God, that he has no needs, that he's doing what he wants, where he wants, when he wants, and that nothing is happening outside of his sovereign plan and will and control. And I love this truth that I see from Mary, not as much from Martha. Martha's busy, but I see it from Mary. The second thing is this, but since he loves us, and I love this. How many of you guys like watching football? Isn't it fun? How many of you guys like playing football even more? The hands went down a little bit just because we get getting older and it doesn't work as well. But no joke, I'll watch football on Thursday. You know what I'm really excited about? I've already started stretching is the Turkey Bowl next Sunday. So the information's in the worship folder. Someone always pulls a hammy and it's a joy to watch and it's usually me. So for your joy, you can come out even if you're not playing and watch. I love watching sports, but honestly, guys, it's a truckload more fun to play to be engaged, and this is what I love. God could continue to go save who he wants to save, how he wants to save, where he wants, but in his sovereign plan, you know what he's done? He said, church, get off the sideline. My plan is that you would engage, and it's for our joy, because I believe there is nothing better than watching someone engage with the gospel for the first time and give their life to becoming a kingdom laborer. Nothing better. So Jesus, in his sovereignty, with the Father and with the Spirit, although they have no needs, because they love us, they invite us to be in the game, to be kingdom laborers, to not sit around passively and say, well, we're just living for eternity, and our eternity is secure, so cool. No, he says, go be the living proof of loving God. Go engage with your neighbors. Go invite them over for Thanksgiving. Go love them perfectly and radically. Don't do it in your own strength, because like the lawyer last week, you'll fail. 
But as you receive that heart transplant, as you start to understand, as you sit at the feet of Jesus and you love him and you learn what he loves, you become like him and then you're sent to go be a kingdom laborer. The second implication for me is simply this. Depending on if you're Mary or if you're like Martha, you'll read this text radically differently. Now, I, I, again, I, I say every week it feels like I don't want the pulpit to be a public time of confession, but I, this might surprise some of you. I have a tendency to be like Martha. I don't want that to shock anybody, but that's a confession. And I don't say that lightly. I say that sincerely. Here's the, the crazy part for many of you. I'm actually better today than I ever used to be. That just shows you how bad I used to be, Right? But there's this sincere confession as we read this text. And as I read this text this week, there was just moments of brokenness because I'm reading this about, man, where am I working too hard? Where am I taking too much control? Where do I think that I actually have power that Jesus never gave me? And I think it's important that we realize when we're most like Martha. I don't know about you, but this was the question from the lawyer last week. How do I get in? And for many of us, when we get really frustrated, because I have a bias against Marys. So if you're a Mary of the world, just don't tell me, and I don't know. But I'm the guy that's working my tail off because life's short and hell's hot, and we've got work to do because people are dying and they're perishing and they're not going to heaven. Do we get that, church? Do we understand how important our labor is? It matters. It matters. That in God's sovereignty, he doesn't need us, but he uses us and he sends us because the harvest is what? Plentiful, but the laborers are few. So I get kind of frustrated with Mary because I'm like, Mary, come on. We've got work to do. And it's totally a bias of mine because life is short and hell is hot. But I forget at times when I judge Mary or I'm prideful or I think that I've done anything that matters, I forget that all of life is about God's compassion and his mercy, which is what leads to my humility. And it's rooted in the fact that he gave me grace and mercy. So when I see Marys of the world, today during teardown, hypothetically speaking, there's no teardown today. Glory be to God. <laughs> it's such a great reminder of it's my heart that's got the issue. So we got to think about that. It's too easy to be angry at other people and God's saying, what about your heart? That's all I care about. I'll do their heart. I'm better with their heart than you are. I'll take care of that. So one of my most like Martha, here's the truth. When my margins are low, like in holidays, when too many people are in the same house, my margins are low and my flesh comes out, which is why I can't just keep saying bad flesh, bad flesh, bad flesh. I actually have to say, Jesus, change me change me because I won't do it on my own. So just realize this week, many of us were excited. We got some days off of work. We got some family. Maybe we're terrified, but many of us, I'm pumped. But if your margin is low, say, Jesus, less of you, more of me, because that's what comes out is the Martha part of me and not the Mary. Talk less church and listen more. I love this line. Don't know who I got it from, but service best set in the context of contact with God. When we serve, can that be an overflow of the fact of us sitting at Jesus' feet? That's when Jesus is going to say, here's what I really care about. So church, I've asked you to be praying this prayer. Not only, God, what are you inviting me into, but also, God, let me love the things that you love. Let me care about the things that you love. Don't go take up a righteous war for Jesus that he's not fighting himself. He doesn't need you, but he's going to use you. It's a weird embracing of tensions. So talk less, listen more to Jesus. And of course, that is emphatically to Jesus, not to anybody else. Read his word, understand what he cares about. And here's the bottom line, church. Where our attention is, that's where our heart is. That's what we looked at this morning. That was a heart inventory. What do we love? What do we value? What do we care about? Where's our time? Where's our treasure? Where's our talent? Where's it going towards? And so I just spent some time this week confessing because my heart at times leaks into idolatry. Idolatry is simply this. Whenever we give something more value than God created it to have, that's what idolatry is. And I think more often than not, my struggle with idolatry is good things that are stealing from God. It's things like moments or monuments. It seems like family and finances. It's persons and places. And it's things that are all good. These aren't bad things. But I've tended to, maybe you have, Give them more value than God intended them to have. Church, seriously, as your friend, as your brother in Christ, confess. Confess of those moments and monuments. Honestly, I think most of us in the church, we need to confess about the political monument that, that it's created in our heart. I thought last week that the election was done. It's not. 
And most of us, we got work to do. Life short, hell's hot. We should be engaged. Don't misunderstand me. But before we do the work, we need to sit at the feet of Jesus. And if we sit at the feet of Jesus, we need to confess. We take a moment and say, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I've taken a moment in life and I've made it a monument. I've taken my family and I've given more value than you want. I've taken my finances and I've cared too much. I've taken persons and places and these might be good things, but I've twisted them and I've missed you. Church, don't miss. Life with Jesus is too valuable to miss on good things. So, so here's the question for us. Strive to be a Mary and a Martha world. Let's do it. I, I'm Martha. I've already told you I'm Martha. But I believe that God is calling us to sit at the feet of Jesus and to be like him. And I'm not beating up on, on Martha. I hope you don't feel beat up if you're Martha. But I also hope you hear me say, I don't want you to miss the glory and the grace of being like Mary and sitting at Jesus' feet and being that. So let's sit. I love this. We actually have a venue that's allowing us to come back tonight. We have a worship pastor that's got a killer team. They've created a night of worship for us tonight to come and sit at the feet of Jesus. What a great application. Start your Thanksgiving week praising God and taking communion tonight, 515, right here. Just sitting at the feet of Jesus, not talking, listening, hearing his heart. And so the question for many of us as we go is how? How do we do that? And I've got some good friends. Vincent Dunlow, would you guys come on up here? Some good friends that are, again, sinners saved by grace, saints who really sin, but they've helped me in my passion for wanting to be like Mary in a Martha world because productivity and activity doesn't always go in line. So Vince and Delma, they, they've moved here a couple of years ago. They've become good friends. We, I think we met through church, but then we've done Little League together and sports and all sorts of things. Our kids are on the Warriors for basketball this year. So with all of this stuff, with basketball and family and elections and being the living proof of a loving God, you guys have said, man, we're here because we want to sit at the feet of Jesus. We want to help other people sit at the feet of Jesus. And you guys started something called Be Still Retreats. You've been doing them for years. What are those? What are Be Still Retreats? We've advertised them before. I was a part of the last one. What are they? Um, so Be Still Retreats um, are basically just time to carve out sweet moments with Jesus. Um, we just start at nine o'clock and we do a breakfast and um, we get together and we do a devotional. And then after that devotional and just a time of sharing, if people want to share kind of what their expectations are. Um, and then after we've done that and there's a time of confession and prayer, um, after we've done all that, then we release everyone to... Um, areas on our property. We just have five acres, but we also live in an area that has lots of um, trails and spaces where you can spread out and just find that solitude with Jesus. Um, during that time, uh, there's a lot of um, freedom in that. And when we're doing our devotional, we also teach how to be still because it's it's not something that comes naturally to right. us. We had to learn that. So, um, so we give you some things that you can do to help redirect your mind to center on Christ. And um, then we give some supplemental material too in case you just can't get your mind from wandering to things that are distractions. Um, Vince and I stay on the property so that if you do the supplemental material and you still can't get away from stuff that are bothering you and you need extra prayer, um, you can come and sit with us and we'll pray with you, talk, talk to you a little bit and encourage um, you. And then about an hour um, before the retreat ends, which is at four o'clock, so at three o'clock, we get back together and we just kind of debrief. And that's my favorite part, just hearing what God did with your time. And, um, and then we do a blessing. We pray for everyone that attended, um, and it's just a so, sweet So about time. six hours of quiet. So I don't know when the last time you guys were quiet for six hours. Many of you moms right now are like, yes, please, <laughs> sign me up. But six hours of silence. Now, for the average Christian in America right now, does that intimidate the crud out of us? 
You want me to be still and silent for six hours? And, and so, Vince, for you, again, you and I are similar. We're Warriors fans. And, and, and so how, what did you experience when you, because you've been doing these for years, what did you experience that of being still for six hours? What was that like? It was easy, right? Of course not. <laughs> so, um, so I always look forward to my Be Still retreats. You know, there's always something that, you know, the Lord teaches me or encourages me in. And uh, some days uh, I just sit there and find rest. You know, some days I find clarity in a decision that I needed to make. Um, And some days I just sit and enjoy God's creation. So um, for myself, it's been a real um, encouragement for me and a real, um, it helped me in my R1 relationship with the Lord. And it's also helped me in my marriage as well. You know, because a lot of times Dylan and I will do our Be Still retreats um, on the same day, and sometimes going into those retreats, we may separate. have had, yeah, separate, we may have had an, an argument or a disagreement, and I tell you the truth, you know, spending a day with the Lord is really hard to come back, you know, without having a change of heart, a change of attitude right. and stuff, so, um, yeah, like you were saying, asking me, it is, it is really hard to sit and be still, you know, because there's many things that we need to to get done you know like martha you know there's so many things that that we have on our list yep and um <clears throat> sorry i took some notes here i don't like talking in front of people so. <laughs> no worries so you know the first hour yeah so the first hour my be still retreat is really hard for me because i'm you know th- sitting there thinking about you know what i need, what you got to do what i got to do at work what i got to do at home and you know thinking about stupid stuff too like what am I have? What am I going to have for dinner tonight? You know, am I going to cook? Is my wife going to cook? I don't know if it's the guy thing, Drew, but do we always think about food or what our next yes. meal is? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. So, um, so you know, when that happens, I just have to sit, you know, and, and pray to the Lord. And you know, to tell you the truth, at the end of the day, I'm really thankful that I chose to sit, you know, with the Lord instead of knocking things out on my to-do list. Yeah. And, and what I'm convicted by is that to do anyone to-do list people, anyone out there? You got your list? In fact, let's be honest. Like half you just wrote them during the sermon, right? <laughs> we got stuff to do, which is super ironic if that was you this morning. I love it. You and Jesus can have a great talk about that while you're doing your to-do list. But I love it. Like I'm embarrassed. Vince and I were talking. Like I'm embarrassed at times of the things that occupy my mind. Like, and they're good things like renovations at the church. And some of them are stupid things like fantasy football. And some of them are great things like my kids. But, but that which we've let occupy our mind, it's a discipline. To say, i, I got to do less of that and more of sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening to him. In fact, Dylan, you and I were talking recently because I love this stuff. And again, my Sabbath, if you ever try to call me on a Friday, you probably won't get me. I put the moon mode on in my phone and I'm untouchable, right? Because I need to listen to Jesus. And, and that's imperative. In fact, I used to say things like, but Delna, I don't have time to Sabbath. I don't have time to be still. And Delna Grace was like, Drew, you don't have time not to. Because what starts to happen if I go race off on my own, right, is I'm doing all these good things like Martha, and I'm actually missing the best thing. And I might be doing things that Jesus is like, I didn't ask you to do that. I didn't ask you to go talk to that person. I asked you to buy them coffee. But I asked you to talk to them. You talked to them, and you had coffee breath, and you just messed it all up. And, but again, Jesus doesn't need us, so take some pressure off. But what I would just encourage you. To make sure you're finding time. We, 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 these guys offer these every quarter. You don't have to wait for every quarter. What, why, why do we do them? Again, for me, it's this idea of life short, hell's hot, and on one level, I can be so focused, I can miss the best thing. Well, why else do we do them? How would you encourage us? Well, for me, um, if I don't do them, Vince pays. Mm. <laughs> Everyone pays. Um, I pay. I just, if I don't, I mean, it was hard at first to do them like Vince was saying, but um, I think like five years ago, we learned how to do it maybe three years ago. We had a pastor kind of teach us and his mentor came in and, you know, taught us how to be still. And then um, we would do them hit or miss. And then um, maybe four, five years ago, I had a brain tumor. So in the hospital for 
several weeks, um, it was so sweet, like those sweet moments with Jesus, like mm -hmm. when everyone is quiet and your kids are farmed out to other people and just the, the magnitude of that on our lives, like we say it was the best marriage retreat ever, just being able to be In the hospital, still. you're hearing this, right? <laughs> um, being able to be still. And so after that, I think our hunger really grew for it. And so yeah. then we've been doing this on our own probably for uh, four years probably now, um, every month. And so if you can't make it or you can't wait for a quarterly retreat, um, hit us up. We don't do the whole like devotional thing because we kind of already have a knowledge of, you know, kind of how it flows for us. Um, but if you need that accountability or, you know, you want to join us, then that's good. But if we don't do it now, it's like missing your quiet time or missing time spending with Jesus for a shorter period of time every day. You're just different. And, and, and that's what I don't want to miss, church. Like, I'm a Pharisee. I've already said that. So I don't want to create one more thing that we're supposed to do, right. that we should do. I just want us to look at our life, and for every single one of us, I bet that we could do a little more of this, a little more sitting at the feet of Jesus, a little more listening, and, and here's my promise. Let, let, let's give these guys a round of applause. Thank you guys just for, for modeling and for living. But here's my promise. As you sit at the feet of Jesus, if you're, you must be occupied with Jesus before you can be occupied for him. That's a game changer. We must, as Christians, be occupied with Jesus before we can be sent to go be with for him. Because here's the reality. There was a, a brilliant theologian named Tommy Boy, and he once said, the best salesmen are satisfied customers. Church, as you reflected on your life this past week, did you see God's faithfulness? If you didn't see it, that's not because he wasn't there. It's because you weren't looking. He was in every detail at every second of every moment. So church, this morning, can we start with knowing our heart? I want us to be kingdom laborers, don't misunderstand me, but Jesus is the king of the harvest. He's the king. He's got a plan. So before we're sent to go be the living proof of loving God, because we understand that the time, and you heard Delna's answer, why does she do it? Did you hear what it was? Her joy. I want to. Because when I don't, I suffer, my family suffers, and I'm not the kingdom laborer that God designed us to be, the people of peace, to go give peace. And we're going to experience that when our knees hit the ground and when we confess and when we repent and we run to the feet of Jesus. Church, would you bow your head and your heart with me? Father God, we want to be like Mary. We want to sit at your feet we want to hear your heart, Jesus, because I believe that when we do that, here's what we hear. I love you. I love you. You're my daughter. You're my son. We don't come to you right now, Jesus, because we need you. Oh, you know how much we need you. But we come to you right now because we care about what you care about and we want to hear you. We want to love what you love and be who you are. We want us to understand, Father God, I pray for my family. I, I want us to understand that our greatest calling in life is not what we do for you, but Father God, what you've done for us in sending your son. So right now, we submit ourselves to you. We love you. We thank you for loving us. We repent. We repent of all the times we've missed you this week, and yet you don't cast us away. You're so patient with Martha. Martha. Thank you for being patient with me. So in your kingdom, this upside down world that you've given us, may we go low so that we might be brought high.